Hello, welcome to episode 80 of Fear of a Black Planet. Uh, I'm going to talk about enchantment today, and it's related to stuff I've talked about many times before. One of the kind of guiding ideas of how I maintain myself as an artist is that being an artist is not about just the technical side which is important, but the, really I think that um, managing inspiration is one of the hardest things and it's about finding techniques to uh, nurture your imagination and to make, to be a bit of a Peter Pan while still existing in the world and that really is the dilemma. For most artists, and I think I think that given the modern days, the modern society's complete capitulation to utilitarian values, it's now almost impossible to just opt out. Um, uh, there's been a successful manipulation and social engineering there, so that it's almost impossible to just be an artist and not take part in the economy in some way. To the, to the extent that it takes up a large part of your time. And I know this because that's my life. <laughs> Believe me, I have tried. And I'm still trying. And I'm always at war with this, with this exact issue. So, but then I think that it can still be done. It can still, it's still possible to, to be an artist. Um, I just think you need to be constantly vigilant, uh, accept that it's a war, accept that it's a battle and that's just the nature of the thing. Um, you can't just uh, opt out now for some reason, something to do with the size of the economy. So much of society is dependent on technology. I think that's probably the main thing is that we're all so dependent on technology for everything that you can't just, you know, unless you've got fuck you money, you can't just, maybe that was always true. I mean, I, would, I think of the Bloomsbury Group as my kind of paradigm idea of people who devoted themselves to art. And um, the truth of the matter is they had fuck you money for their time and they were able to do it. So in absence of that, I've tried to think of strategies of um, enchantment w within the modern world. Excuse me, I'm just, uh, I'm actually just in the process of restarting an old shitty iPhone so that I can get back online. Hopefully it'll work. So if I, if I get distracted, it's only because I need to, need to get through this process and it's just been taking ages. But anyway, so let me bring up my notes here. I've also got a bloody cold, so excuse me if I'm sniffling too much. <coughs> yeah, as I say, the artist's job is to stay enchanted. So that that I th I honestly think that that's ninety percent of the work that an artist has to do. It's a very unpopular view because it's very um, it's very um, hippie almost. It's not, and it's not technical. Being an artist is not about being a technician. It just isn't. You, whatever technique you have is in service of the imagination and your real task. And one of the reasons, another reason it's so unpopular now is that the imagination is almost treated as uh, with contempt. Either you use it in service of just distraction and nonsense, which is what most popular culture is. So the popular imagination is drenched in just drivel and trivia. Or you are supposedly a more cultured person and therefore they treat it with suspicion. So it's basically very difficult to, to even begin to, to get on board with that. So in, right there you've got a challenge as an artist. And I, and I say, and I, maybe this doesn't seem like a big deal to some people, but for me it was a, to get over that psychological hurdle of actually just saying, no, I, my value system is the imagination. I live in service of the imagination. And I believe that the 
the, the uselessness of the imagination, the non-utilitarian nature of the imagination is its use. So I'm actually doing a duty. It's a civic duty to be an artist in that way and to, and to live in nurturing of my imagination and to not be distracted by the day-to-day -day and to not be responsible in that way. And I don't mean responsible in the Jordan Peterson way. I mean, sometimes he can get a bit too conformist as well for my liking, but there's you can be responsible to a sense of meaning and purpose and, and, and uh, to your to your psychological integrity and to your society, but you don't have to be responsible in the way to other people just for the sake of it. So uh, that's the way I look at that. Um, so actually by be, by sort of pulling back and by disconnecting from society, you can actually become very important to society. And you just need to look at that for artists throughout the ages. You know, even someone like Chaucer or all these poets from the Middle Ages and, and the early modern era who were warriors and diplomats and things like that, or Milton, they only achieved their art by pulling away from those things. It wasn't like, you know, and people always use the example of T.S. Eliot working in a bank. Well, he did, but not for long. You know, eventually he had to get out and ended up working in publishing. So... Uh, and the, the rest of his life was devoted to a kind of ritualistic uh, nurturing of the imagination. So the, the, the task of it, being an artist today is how do you maintain a sense of enchantment and wonder? Uh, the word devotion comes to mind, but that's just because I was looking at Patti Smith's new book, Devotion which I should really buy. And, and she's very good for this, actually. I mean, she helped me, her M-Train M book helped me realise that actually how productive being unproductive can be, how, pro how productive nurturing the imagination can eventually be. And what, what, what I mean by that is it's sort of a paradox, isn't it? That the, the, the uselessness of your imagination is its use. And that seems like just a kind of Oscar Wilde smarty part pants thing to say, but it's very much um, a real paradox and a and a vital, significant paradox. And the more you meditate on it, the more you realise how how deep it is. Really, the inspiration is killed by utilitarian thinking. Inspiration is killed by thinking ahead what how's how's this going to help me how you know your sort of ego ego egotism or a sense of perfectionism or a sense of like how is this going to seem and how is this going to be viewed so a large part of being an artist is and I, by the way all of these things I, I don't say this with any like sort of you know we're all in the same boat but I just think that from my experience I've learned the hard way that you just have to double down on, on that intuition that you have that it's okay to be a Peter Pan and actually by nurturing that part of yourself that you know to be the best part of yourself despite the fact that people will always tell you you're being irresponsible or immature or narcissistic or uh, solipsistic nothing wrong with being solipsistic actually but um, all those negative interpretations of what people don't understand <coughs> but if you actually do just get past all those psychological blocks, as well as all the physical distractions and uh, the kind of assault of the senses in, in a modern technological, technologically dominated society, once you get past all those, you realise that inspiration starts to take its own course. It's an unconscious process, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and it's so difficult to get into that space now. Um, I find it is, and, and and I think that what I'm getting at in talking about it today, now at this point in my life, is the 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 vigilance that's required. So not only is an artist does an artist have to spend so much time on their craft, constantly learning the technical, support quote unquote. I don't really like that word because it makes it sound like you know sort of 
uh, I'm doing an HND and such and such engineering or something like that. It's no learning a craft is not like that either. It's it's, it's ninety percent intuitive and unconscious as well, or at least it, it once once you start to master it, that's only the beginning. Uh, in terms of technique, you have to imbue your subconscious with it. That's a different process, and that's just as much the technical side of craft. So, so for instance, it's all very well to learn iambic pentameter, but it's about how it takes ages to really imbue your subconscious with it so that you start producing natural inspired stuff in that uh, technical form. That's the real trick of form, isn't it? Same, I mean, guitar players know that as well. Uh, it's one thing to to learn, you know, to to learn how to do eighth note picking, but can you imbue it into your subconscious? And how do you imbue it into the subconscious so that you can get up on stage and it comes naturally to you, so that you can express yourself? And that's the different side of it. But all that aside, none of that's going to happen if you are not in a in an enchanted. Um, state of uh, what Stanislavski called ardor is what I'm getting at that the a kind of um you're possessed by the, the beauty of the or of potential in expression I suppose is a way of putting it so I I think there are a number of ways you can do it uh one of them is definitely to be disciplined in a kind of in your own routine but it's not disciplined in the sense of top down doing it the way you know if you are the kind of person that works best at night then work best at night don't try and be the person that works best in the morning because you think that's what makes you look like you're working hard and you can tell mummy and daddy at home and you can uh, virtue signal to other people that you get up at six in the morning and you, and you crush it you know uh, if you are the person who works best sitting in your pajamas uh, with a notebook and a cup of tea, do it. If you are the person who prefers to sit in a cafe with a berry and a quill, do it. Fucking do it, regardless of how pretentious people say you are. You're, it, that's not the point. The point is doubling down on what you know works. And I think that the, the main point is is it's your creative ritual. It's your creative routine. Again, I got I really learned this. Or I always knew it, but I really learned to accept it from reading Patti Smith's M Treatment. I found that so nurturing to read that book because I realised this. She spends almost all of her life is 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 maintaining this level of enchantment, and to outside eyes who are not artistic, it can seem pretentious or sort of self indulgent, but uh, it works, you know. And the way I look at it is. If you stand for nothing, you fall for anything. That kind of perspective that you by do, by doubling down on the rituals that work for you, you create a kind of force field around you. So that because you you're um, you're not you're not being passive. Do you know what I mean? You're 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 activating your soul in such a way as that you know the, all these distractions and all these um, enemies of the mind and the soul that are active in modern society. <laughs> presuppose passivity that's why a kind of passive acceptance and advertising and propaganda and uh, clickbait news and infotainment all of that is designed to make you passive to be receptive uh, and I, so much of popular culture has become that and I don't say that glibly or with speculation I say that as someone who I don't I think pop culture can be a force for good. Um, but so that that's the main thing, um, and it doesn't have to be twenty hours a day work. You know, in fact, workaholism is going to kill your routine. It's just about having certain anchors throughout the day that that key you into who you are, and uh, to not apologize for them. We all know this, but. I at least know, and, and maybe other people feel like this as well, but I, for a long time I felt guilty about just doing what I know works, you know, um, feeling that, you know, sort of constantly evaluating yourself from the outside. So not only did I have this creative urge and, and, and the need to be this kind of person because of my personality and my soul, 
I also felt the need to constantly apologise for it or to, to, to demonstrate to others that however pretentious and arty-farty I am, I'm still working. I'm still working, honest, you know. Um, and that I, I've really damaged myself through that. And I've uh, damaged my craft through that. Because it compromises your craft if you're constantly thinking about those things. And you can really set yourself back a few years. Take it from me. If you don't just double down and, 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 and risk seeming arrogant and selfish and, and, and solipsistic to others when you know that you're not, when actually you know that doubling down on the imagination within yourself is going to be of service to other people's imaginative powers. And if, they're, and, and if you are of service to other people's imaginative powers, in some sense, as an artist, your art is liberating them from that very passivity which will keep them enslaved to propaganda, advertising, clickbait, uh, fight or flight techniques of, of, of social engineering, which we're all experiencing right now, and we all know it deep down. Um, and the only cure for it is art. And I really believe that. And that, to me, is where the civic sense of purpose comes from. And it doesn't matter how small, you know, one sonnet that three people read is enough. Because your fight, it's a war of attrition. It's a, it's a game of inches, you know. You, you, uh, we're trying to reclaim the soul inch by inch, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so that brings me to another point. Uh, we have to be absolutely constantly vigilant about our own tendencies to passive passivity addiction and distraction now i am again not saying any of this from a point of view of someone who's mastered this at all i'm still <coughs> stuck in distraction and addiction and constantly addicted to, to social media even though i've pulled back from it uh, it's a it's a, it's a dance with the devil we all have to do, and the more technologically dependent we are in life, the the harder it is to fight it. But I guess that you, as as long as you're in some sense always on the attack and and always on the lookout within yourself to your own weaknesses in that point, the point is not to take it for granted or not to th you know to to be. Um, Engaged with that struggle, I think, is enough, and it's probably the best any of us can do anyway. Uh, and it, it is sort of linked to having having that sense of purpose. And um, I wrote about this in my review of Jordan Peterson's book, relating it to David Foster Wallace's point about TV culture and, and uh, the modern novel. And obviously, David Foster Wallace was saying that a sort of sense of nihilistic, snarky sarcastic, you know, a kind of crude base version of smarty pants irony had taken over the culture in Western, in, in the Anglosphere, effectively. And uh, uh, this was in some sense, a mu initially a response to dumbed down culture, but actually had become uh, subsumed into dumbed down culture. So that as long as you kept, te as long as, Snark was now being used as a way to pacify people. So as long as people felt like they were smarter than this cheesy kitsch that they were watching on TV, they were still going to watch it. And that's so true, isn't it? We're all the same. And so social media is just an amped up version of what David Foster Wallace was talking about in the early 90s. We all like to snark about Twitter, but we all still use it. And part of that snark keeps us using it, which is the, the irony. And what I said about Jordan Peterson's book is that he had rehabilitated the idea of meaning and meaningful meaning to the to the point where we create a sort of existentialist idea of meaning where we create our own purpose in the world and that self-generated purpose trumps all other forms of distraction. And I think that that's tied to what I'm saying about having rituals and routine and what I learned from Patti Smith. There's a connection there. And for the artist, that is the meaningful uh, to pur pursuit of the meaningful comes in pursuit of the imagination, the things that stimulate us, the things that appeal to us for no reason. So if you walk past um, a junk shop and, and for some reason um, there's, a, there's a, a wooden carving of an eagle and you don't know why it enchants you, it just does. There's no explanation, there's no utilitarian explanation. 
uh, or reason. It's just, it just does. Having the, it seems like such a trivial thing, but actually having the, the wherewithal to listen to that and to and to recognize the 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 power of it for you personally, regardless of how it might silly and trivial it might look to to others outside. That is actually that those that's the little game of inches I'm talking about. The, you're able to to maintain self-generated meaning, so that however much the encroachment of popular culture and distraction and social media and dumbed-down culture will always be uh, a battle you're fighting, you will have this resource. And and I really think and I said the title of the piece on Jordan Peterson, why Jordan Peterson is why the real reason Jordan Peterson is dangerous, and it's he's dangerous because so much of our culture is is invest consumerist culture, political culture, um, popular culture, the, the sort of the 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 nature of public discussion, the agora, which we now find on Twitter and Facebook. So much of that is about is dependent upon and is dedicated towards maintaining a kind of um, passivity through the back door. So we all think that we're engaging, but it's passivity through engagement. And uh, a commitment to the imagination will help with uh, those kind of distractions because it generates senses of meaning that are not dependent on others and are self-generating and, and creative, which is an essential part of being human. So it's it, those little moments, and I, I and maybe, honestly, yeah, I'm sure there's many people saying, this is just obvious stuff, but it wasn't obvious to me. So much of my development was thwarted that through sort of uh, subtle forms of conformity that, uh, this stuff was not obvious to me, and I had to learn it the hard way, and um, that's sad. That's sad, uh, because. But it, what it makes me realise is just so how much how how automatic that indoctrination against your own soul is, in in the kind of type of culture that we live in, and I do blame a lot of this on consumerism, and why I still go back to people like Bill Hicks. And why I still would consider myself, if I had to place myself politically, on the left. Because that critique of mass culture and, and mass media is more pertinent than it ever was. Um, because, of the, because it's an assault on individual creative thinking. And there is no society. There is no trust in the other. There is no uh, citizenship. There, there is no fucking morality without, create, without the imagination. Uh, that's uh, something I get from the romantics, and I absolutely 100% live by it. And that therein lies the the use and purpose, if you need one at all, for being an artist. So we can get rid of any sense of us being idle, bone idle, pretentious wankers, because the more you nurture your own imagination, the more... Uh, you nurture the imagine the collective imagination, and that's just a fact. There's no science needed. There's no logic needed. Anybody that has a problem with that is a cunt, as far as I'm concerned, and can fuck off. And I mean those hard words because I'm. And the reason why I'm angry about it is I'm sick and tired of having to justify myself. You know, it's so much of what I talk about is that, isn't it? It's 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 this sort of need to to justify my existence as an artist as if it's sort of uh, extraneous and, and, and a kind of uh, self-indulgent luxury. Well, it isn't. It really isn't. Um, we, we wouldn't have so much of our culture without the imagination and without the artists that have fed that imagination within themselves and for other people. Uh, and so I do get angry with people who, who try to sort of challenge that with what about her, what about this? I don't care, you know, who you like to be. No, I don't like to be challenged on that issue because I've had to have it so many times. It's so boring and so predictable. There's never any new challenge to that, ever. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure most people like, who are listening to this probably don't even have, have never had this problem and don't even, don't really know what I'm talking about. But it's that is one of the big problems I've had in my life. 
is justifying my existence as an artist and feeling ashamed for it. Um, anyway, another strategy, which I think is the main one, really, because it's so difficult, <laughs> and it speaks to what I was talking about at the opening, in the opening remarks to this podcast, but we need to be, in a way, schizoid. We actually do need to be kind of split personalities as artists. Because you need to be the Peter Pan. You do. You, there's there's something essentially childlike and infantile about being an artist. Because you need because because you need to have that child's access to the imagination, and you also have to have have that child's access to wonder. So you need to see the world with that sense of wonder that a child has, and that goes to you know. William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, you know. Uh, and, and and people who are not artists are, don't understand that, and it's part of all these suspicions that you get and part of the reason why our culture is so... The more cynical a, a culture becomes or the more um, developed a culture becomes, the less... The, less, the, the, the harder it is to be creative, actually. And we really are experiencing that. We're so technologically advanced. And we're so chuffed with ourselves. And the sort of critical mind has, has, has made so many gains that it's for, it's any kind of talk about like what I'm talking now is treated with suspicion. And I understand that, but we have to be vigilant within ourselves. God knows I've got that within me. But you have to be vigilant about it. And you have... <clears throat> but the, the the other side of that is that <clears throat> because you're always on the back foot and there's no way to avoid the culture now, you can't just, unless you've got ridiculous fuck you money, you can't just bomb, uh, bail out of society in the way that you could maybe even 50 years ago. You can't be like the Beats, you know, in San Francisco in mid-50s. You, it's, it's, it's not really possible to do. You can sort of do it. And, uh, but you can't entirely do it. And uh, so in some sense, you've got to have the ability to be your own parent and your own child is what I'm getting at. You have to, to live in the adult world. And this is all me talking with hard-won experience uh, and, you know, resentfully. So uh, I've, I, I, the, the only, this is the close I can get. I have to be a kind of schizoid. So I have to, you know, I'm, I work part-time and I have to be, sort of on the attack in terms of money, in terms of uh, discipline and, 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 and paying dues to this ever-encroaching world so that you can always keep pushing back. The only way to fight it, in a way, is to be one step ahead of it, if you know what I mean. So in some sense, you have to be super disciplined and responsible so that within yourself, there's this other part of yourself or this other part of your life that can be allowed to to, to just kind of meander <laughs> and and be childlike and, and chase butterflies, you know, and, and live with enchantment. So the only way that you can actually create a space of enchantment is to to, to kind of um, have one foot in the in the day-to-day -day boring world of the man. Uh, it's the only way I've thought about it. And as long as you don't go all in, you're, you're resisting conformity in a way, but if you can't beat them, join them in a sort of way. <laughs> Uh, you have to, to think of yourself as a kind of spy in in the enemy territory. And that's the way, that is the way I do think of myself. Uh, and it, it helps. That's, I guess that's a, that it's not a bad way of going about it. Because you don't want to have a, like an actual schizoid split because it's dangerous. So if you think of yourself as on a kind of adventure and you're in an enemy territory... And you're basically smuggling in enchantment through the back door. That's quite a nice way to think about it. Yeah. <coughs> but uh, that's I've again. That is something I have learned the hard way. Um, and I have to, and it's a constant battle for me. That and has actually been the most draining, difficult challenge. Of my adult life, probably is to to maintain 
that essential love of enchantment that is the main part of my personality. Because the thing is, is if because what I have done in the past is I've just kind of decided to ignore the world and completely and, and just say, well, fuck it, I don't need to do what you tell me to do. But what happens is it's such a powerful... That actually makes you passive. That's the problem. Uh, because the world is on the attack all the time now. Money, the economy, technology, it's always on the attack. So if you're not on the attack too, you'll become completely swallowed up by it if you just stay still. So in that sense, it's 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 almost impossible to be a, 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 an old school bohemian because the world will just come along and swallow you up. Uh, and that's what does happen. So in some sense, you've got to be this split personality. Oh, that's how I've maintained it. And uh, that's the best I can do. But this idea of... Um, Avoiding uh, the distractions, <laughs> I, I recognise that that is easier said than done. I really do, because I'm crap at it, as much as anyone else is crap at it. Um, so I'm not coming at it from a moral high ground at all. You know, uh, we could live in the country. You know, we could uh, have fuck you money and buy a cottage and live in the country. And if anyone does that, if anyone's got money, that is what I would do. As a friend of mine asked me, what, what should I do with this money I've inherited? I said, I just like... Use it to pursue some creative, pursue what, you know, don't, don't invest it in anyone else's idea of what success is. Use it to free yourself from this, would be my answer. And um, That's not so obvious, I guess, uh, as it is to me, but it's only obvious to me because I've kind of, it's, it's been hard won uh, <coughs> through my own mistakes. So you could do that if you've got, you know, you can live in the country and, and, and in that sense you can live like the Bloomsbury Group, buy a cottage and just live your own life. But you need the money for that. You need some force field around you to stop the encroachment of the world because it, it's coming whether you like it or not. The technology world, the, the, the mass economy, consumerism, you know, it's coming. There's no nowhere safe. So you, you have to be on the attack in order to not be on their defense is the only way. If you've got, you could form your own community, but I found this, and this could be a reflection of me more than anything else, uh, and I'm willing to accept that, but you have to, you, you, it's becoming harder and harder. And one of the reasons I think it's hard <laughs> is that the democratization of art has been a great thing, but as I've said previously, on recent podcasts, it's a double-edged sword. And one of the, the downsides of it is that even people who are not artists, though everyone, as I've said before, everyone's creative, but not everyone's an artist. The people who are creative, but not artists, resent artists more than the people who are not that particularly creative. So this middle ground of person really resents it if you dedicate your life to art because they're quite creative too and but they're not so creative that they'd rather die than not be creative um so they really resent that in other people because it, it sort of suggests that there's a hierarchy of creativity in some sense but that, it doesn't suggest that but that's how it appears to their utilitarian mind so it's very hard you, you think you found your community, you think you found your tribe, but actually you found your enemy. Your enemy is uh, closer. Your enemy is more similar to you than the people you think are your enemy, you know? Um, and there's a natural, there's always a natural competitiveness and uh, potential fratricide that can happen with artistic personalities, particularly poets. <laughs> um, but all of this just contributes to make it very hard to find your tribe. And I'm not, again, not raising myself. I'm just as much of a bastard as anyone else, just as egotistical, just as narcissistic, just as insecure. 
So, and I think this is, I think this is a lot of this has been amplified by technology and the democratization of art. So that you can, you, you think you found your artistic tribe, but actually they don't share the same values as you. And you don't share the same values as them. Uh, and so you could actually endanger your creativity when you think that you, and, and threaten your, your craft again. Uh, so it's dangerous and, but sad because we, that would be a great way to stay, to, to, to maintain that sense of meaning that kind of frees you from the distractions and the encroachments of the world. Um, and that was indeed the way Bloomsbury did it, wasn't it? That was what that's all about, and, you know, and the idea, and that's what you get, you see that with bands. I remember, I think I remember um, Tom Petty saying this, the, and the Beatles said it as well. That they were they were, they were a universe to themselves. You know, they didn't care what anyone else. And that really, that's great. You know, that's that's the joy. If you can find that that you're, you know, you're a band on the run. Uh, that's the that's a a real ideal, but it's not so obviously available <laughs> as I once thought it might be. Um, and you know, as I say, I take full responsibility for my own lack of it. Well, not full responsibility, but I take a large bar of responsibility for it. Um, but I would rather be, I'd rather err on the side of selfish unsociability, frankly, as well. So I have to admit that. Um, but I think that's the, the different for different artists, you know. I think that if you're painters, um, and this is the other side of me that's an actor, which really loves sharing and workshopping pieces and just having that intimate relationship with others through the art. That I do like, but with certain kinds of art, you, like being a, just a writer, you want to you know, um, maintain. So that, that, can, that can be the hardest for, for, for poets and writers to, to, to find a tribe because you, you're probably not going to find a tribe and they're all, and when you do, you sort of resent them anyway. <laughs> um, it's a very, it, it's necessarily a life of solitude. And uh, so that can be difficult to, to do. But if, if you are in a lucky situation of being able to find a tribe of like-minded people who are creative but also share your values about what art and creativity are and their potential and their power, then fucking all power to you as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that, that would be one of my dreams. And I think that that's, a, you know, yeah, it's one, it's one, it's a huge force field against the forces of, of uh, mediocrity and consumption, which are taking over the world. One of the things I did learn from the B Bloomsbury group, though, uh, and why I, you know, and also Patty Smith, <coughs> And this requires vigilance, and again, I'm not saying I do it all the time, but I've certainly tried more recently to do this as much as possible, is to make everything in your life a work of art. As much as possible. So that you, you know, you don't buy a poster, even, you know, from, from Ikea. You, you make your own poster. You know, uh, you make your own blanket. You make your own, you, you mend your own clothes, you, you know. You're creatively involved with even the sort of mundane aspects of your life, and and Bloomsbury were great at that. You know, um, the you know we need a bookshelf, let's build one. You know, we need to paint the fireplace, let's paint it as a work of art, not just as an ornament. Um, so you're creatively engaged with even the most mundane aspects of your life. This one is a good one for me. This one works for me. And the only barrier to it would be my own laziness or my own uh, remaining creative blocks. But I find that that's a real deadly weapon against the forces of mediocrity. And will constantly... Because for one thing, just on a practical level, it frees you from the cycle of consumption to a large degree because you're not dependent on outside services to beautify your life. To, to feel comfortable in your life, the, the, the aesthetic experience and enjoyment of your life is completely in command with you. Uh, 
and I suppose you can you could say that the the kind of craft culture that's emerged with craft beer and um and all that has has to some extent brought that back, but that's a kind of yuppie ersatz version. And as I've said before, kind of bohemianism has been turned into yuppieism. But I think there is a way of distinguishing between true bohemianism and, and yuppieism. And it's fashion. Boho chic. Like the original Bohemians whatever generation you want to talk about them, one of the defining factors was they were not chic. They were boho, but they were not chic. And I think that you recognise a true boho from just someone who's dressing arty in a fashionable way. When you see someone expressing themselves and being totally socially unacceptable and garish, that's a real boho right there. Um, that was the origin of the term. It was people who dressed in like so startling, startlingly, outlandishly, that they reminded polite society of gypsies. It's so the, it's not a, um, a, a, a hierarchical term. Bohemianism. It's like, oh, that's not real bohemianism, man. Real bohemians, like if you're living like actually, no. It was a, always a term of analogy. It was always a term of metaphor to describe, usually middle class people who we're not conforming to the norms of the sort of bourgeoisie conformity. And uh, that's the key. I mean, so much of fashion is bougie conformity, but it's bougie conformity by selling you difference, the conformity of difference. Whereas someone who's really not conforming, you, you, it, it, you, you know the difference because they'll be wearing this horrible, sickly yellow shirt should have no place in polite society, but they're wearing it with a kind of disregard, uh, you know. So there's a kind of um, inappropriateness and um, almost sort of sickly OTT aspect to a true boho gypsy. And it's that that's the, the real mark of, of bohemianism. And I think that actually to live your life as much as possible in that vein is the real... Uh, vital weapon against passivity, conformity, sneering, self-congratulating, um, smugness and cynicism and nihilism. The real weapon is a kind of disregard of polite ideas. Um, so you can adopt a kind of flannel shirt and G Levi's and think you're Kerouac, but the real Kerouac was he lived like a boho you know he would come in you know he would disappear and then come back to his friends almost mexican in his tan skin uh you know hard skin um smelling uh you know just not socially adaptable in any way. There's a socially adaptable version of it, the sort of high street boho chic look. But the mark of it is that there's a guttural feeling when you when you see a real bohemian that they're they're really inappropriate and they sort of set you on edge. Um, and uh, that's the key. And that's a that's I'd say that's more foreign to our now in our so called uh, Countercultural world than it was in the 1950s. That true bohemianism, but we just have an ersatz, polite, uh, perfumed version of it. Um, so there you go. Those are my thoughts on maintaining enchantment. But all of this is in service of the opposite of propaganda, the opposite of manipulation, the opposite of advertising, the opposite of clickbait and scrolling, which is enchantment which is a very difficult thing to pin down completely, but just a, I would describe it as a relishing of the imaginative process just for its own sake. That's the, the, 